December 4, 1862. The California Gold Rush. Two men squared off on the wide, dusty road on the front street of Oroville, California. One was 28-year-old Spaniard Juan Fernandez. The other was 29-year-old Deputy Sheriff John Lyons. The men began to argue, but their dispute wasn't over a matter of law. The dispute was over money. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the sheriff drew a dagger and stabbed Juan Fernandez in the breast. Fernandez gasped and fell to the ground. The sheriff fled, running away on foot, leaving Fernandez to die. Fernandez pulled the dagger from his chest and with his dying breaths began to chase the sheriff. A bystander saw Fernandez running with the dagger and tackled him. Fernandez died moments later before he could get his revenge. A judge charged John Lyons with cold-blooded murder and issued an arrest warrant, but no one could find him anywhere. Even his wife and kids didn't know. He simply vanished. When he turned up again, it would be in a new place, with a new name, a new identity, and the same old tricks. You're listening to Wrangle History Unlocked presents Strange Customs. It's the true story of crime, corruption, justice, and power in Alaska. It's about law, from the people who make them to the people who break them. And it covers one crazy year in Wrangle history, 1874, the fever peak of the Cassiar Gold Rush, when a fugitive from justice became the most powerful man in Fort Wrangell, Alaska. I'm your host, Ronan Rooney. This is part one, The Ring of Corruption. Chapter 1. A Man Named John There are a lot of mysteries about this man. He worked in the shadows and dealt in covert influence. He was always in and out of court, and any time he was handed official government responsibility, it ended in disaster. And yet, he survived every setback and lived another day to cheat someone out of their money. He was born John Malson, in 1833 Kentucky. His parents were Francis Malson and Elizabeth Cambridge, both of them descendants of former slaves and European settlers. That John Malson was of mixed race is one of the great mysteries of his life because he passed himself as white to all who came to know him and listed as white on at least four censuses. In none of the many conflicts he encountered in his life was his African-American ancestry ever used against him. By 1860, John Malson was living in Butte County, California during the California Gold Rush. He was a 27-year-old married father of two little girls. He listed his occupation as speculator, a type of short-term investor. In 1861, he appealed directly to the California legislature to let him legally change his last name, from Malson to Lyons. After the Senate and House approved it, and the governor signed it into law, John Malson became John A. Lyons. A speculator he may have been, but the only investments John Lyons seemed to make were losing bets. As the United States fell into civil war to the east, John Lyons fell into debts left and right. He was repeatedly in the newspapers for disputes over unpaid debts. The local sheriff posted a notice. Sheriff sale! By virtue of an execution issued out of the Honorable Justice's Court of Jasper Coggins, I have this day levied upon and seized, and will expose to public sale at the courthouse door, all the right, title, interest, and claim of the said John Lyons. The California Gold Rush was about played out, and times were tougher. John Lyons found work as a deputy to the local sheriff. In August 1862, he nearly killed a Chinese man. The Oroville Weekly Union. 
The Chinese man, for cutting whom Lyons was fined $500 last August, is still alive, though very severely wounded at the time. $400 of the sum was remitted by Governor Stanford. John Lyons had bad debts and a bad temper. It was his run-in with Juan Fernandez that would lead to life-altering consequences. The Oroville Union Weekly. It appears that Lyons and another party were talking about making a horse race when Fernandez, who had been drinking a little, said he had a horse that he would run with either of them. Lyons made some remark to the effect that Fernandez was too drunk to talk with, to which the deceased took exception. A few angry words passed when both sprang to their feet and clinched, and almost immediately the deceased was heard to exclaim, I'm killed! The parties were separated with some difficulty, and it was found that Fernandez had a large dirk knife some six inches long in his hand, which he afterwards said he had wrenched from Lyons the moment he was stabbed. With this weapon, he would have undoubtedly killed Lyons had he not been restrained. Although no blows were seen to pass, Fernandez was found to have received a stab just below the ribs and a little on the left side, which severed some of the branches of the mesenteric artery, causing death from the internal hemorrhage yesterday morning about 7 o'clock. When John Lyons vanished, he left behind his wife and two little girls, one still an infant. He left behind hundreds of dollars in unpaid debts, including to his own lawyer. He fled Oroville and intended to never return. And he would never again use the name John Lyons. Once again, he changed his name. John Lyons became John Carr. John Carr's wife and children finally reunited with him in Idaho, but the family wouldn't stay there long. Things were about to get much, much more strange. The family moved to Portland, Oregon. Chapter 2. Stumptown. They called it Stumptown because of the miles of tree stumps that covered the ground, in anticipation of the great city it was about to become. Portland, Oregon grew up from the mud, one boardwalk at a time. Settlers flooded into the land occupied by the tribes of the Multnomah, Clackamas, Kalapuya, and other native peoples who lived in the rich, fertile valley where the Willamette and Columbia Rivers converge. John Carr was one of those settlers. When he fled California, he left behind the name John Lyons forever. His eldest daughter even changed her name from Marianne to Harrietta. There's no doubt John Carr was fleeing his criminal past. He had unpaid debts and the murder of Juan Fernandez on his record. But there's another reason John Carr may have needed to separate himself from his past race. When John Carr arrived in Oregon, it was illegal to be black. It was a new rule enshrined in the Oregon State Constitution by the voters. Even mixed-race men like John Carr were prohibited from entering the state. His new name and identity reduced the chance that somebody might catch on. It's not clear exactly when it happened, but John Carr became a political henchman, and that's putting it politely. He was a fixer, a problem solver, an arm twister, and a minion of Oregon's political machine. Publicly, he ran a saloon in Portland, but privately, he was part of Portland's political influence peddling underground. In the 1860s, Oregon politics were explosive. Oregon was a bona fide state in the Union, with a seat in the House and two in the Senate. Abraham Lincoln needed the support of Congress to get through the difficult years of war, and that meant Oregon's vote mattered. While Oregon was miles away from Washington, D.C., its influence only grew throughout the war. Money and political interests flooded into the state. For some, the new state of Oregon felt like a fresh start to the problems back east. By this time, the South had cut itself off from the North, seceded, and declared war. The North was occupied by generations-old entrenched interests who jealously guarded their power. 
Oregon represented the idea of the frontier, a new beginning, opportunity, and free of entanglement. With that, many settlers moved west to start over anew. John Carr found his way into the services of a man who came to Oregon for a fresh start and the politics. Serious historians who are not given to exaggeration think this man may be the most corrupt politician in the history of the United States. John Hipple Mitchell. By the mid 1860s, John Hipple Mitchell was a rising star of Portland politics. Mitchell had been Portland's city attorney and a member of the Oregon legislature. He was married to the daughter of a prominent Oregon family. He wore a long, sleek beard beneath an ample mustache. He was known for his charm and wit, along with an ambition for a career advancement. But privately, John Hipple Mitchell was a ruthless, dishonest lawyer willing to betray anyone who put their trust in him. To help you understand, this is a segment we're going to call the John Hipple Mitchell Swindle. The very first man executed in the brand new state of Oregon was Danford Balk. He was hanged in broad public view for shooting and killing a man who attempted to elope with Balk's teenage daughter. Danford Balk left behind a wife, eight children, and a vast tract of Portland land. As Danford Balk swung, John Hipple Mitchell made a plan to get that land. Mitchell cozied up to the widow, Mary Jane Balk, and persuaded her to make him her lawyer. Mary Jane couldn't read and suddenly had to support herself and eight children. She agreed and gave in to Mitchell. Then he got to work. Without her knowledge, she signed her name with an X on papers handing over custody of her children to a complete stranger. Mitchell swindled her out of her own kids. The stranger, a man named C.S. Silver, used his power as the children's legal guardian to sell their property at market. The children's property was sold to none other than John Hipple Mitchell. The land was valued at $22,000, but Mitchell only paid $2,500. Mitchell quickly flipped the deed to a Portland businessman for $15,000. Mitchell netted $12,500. By the time the Balk family caught on, the land was gone. Newspaper ads openly advertised the property for sale. For John Hipple Mitchell, the scheme worked perfectly. He got the goods and handed off the bag before anyone knew what he'd done. Where some confidence men dwell in the shadows, John Hipple Mitchell's swindles appeared in public notices. He understood the legal process and how to use it as both a weapon and a shield. True to form, his swindles always betrayed the people who trusted him the most. John Hipple Mitchell's political ambition was obvious. Mitchell set his sights high to a seat in the United States Senate. This was a shrewd choice for Mitchell. It was not only, perhaps, the most powerful elected position from Oregon, but did not require a vote of the public. Instead, Senate seats were appointed by Oregon's legislature. Winning a Senate seat was about pulling the levers of political influence, not necessarily influencing the public. It was a process that favored insiders and deal-makers. For years, Mitchell had to watch other men descend to this seat of power he could only crave, but not quite reach. In 1868, John Hipple Mitchell met the man with deep pockets who could make all his dreams come true, Ben Holiday, a.k.a. the Stagecoach King. He was a crass, stubborn, hard-nosed, self-made man who built his empire on stagecoach routes. For a time, he owned the Pony Express, when he sold out to Wells Fargo, he claimed his fortune and moved out west to a city destined to become a transportation hotspot, Portland, Oregon. One of his first acts in Portland was to steal a railroad contract away from a competitor. He simply stole their identity, built his own railroad under their name, and then created a controversy around whose railroad was better. In the end, the city of Portland formally recognized Ben Holiday's railroad as the winner and gave him the contract. From that point on, he became an influential figure in Portland business and, of course, politics. Ben Holiday's bankroll and Mitchell's ambitions were a perfect match. 
According to the legend, John Hipple Mitchell is supposed to have said, Ben Holiday's politics are my politics, and what Ben Holiday wants, I want. And thus, Ben Holiday and John Hipple Mitchell's ring of corruption was born. As Oregon politics sunk further into the mud, one man did what he thought would elevate it. Judge Matthew Deedy was Portland's civic father, an idealist who believed that cities were not built on boardwalks alone, but on law and justice. He was a settler who arrived in the 1850s. He was temperamentally cool and towed the line of the conventions of his day. He supported slavery until after the Civil War when it became illegal, and he became opposed to it. He also had an appreciation for written law that surpassed his peers. He derived personal joy at serving as a sort of librarian of the law. He painstakingly collected old laws, sometimes on scraps of paper, corrected the mistakes, resolved conflicting versions, and even wrote portions of laws. Legal scholars today call this the DD Code. As a judge, he often heard cases based on laws he helped create. Where Judge Deedy actively fundraised for Portland's libraries and universities, Ben Holiday and John Hippo Mitchell looked for ways to enrich themselves. Judge Deedy couldn't stand John Hippo Mitchell. Over the years, Mitchell's star continued to rise, and Deedy could not mask his disgust. Mitchell noticed, and in April 72, he confronted Deedy about it. As Deedy recalled, had a long talk with Mitchell in which I told him that I liked him personally, but disliked his political action because he had too much business in politics. He said that he had the impression that I did not like him and had not invited him to our house when we entertained Judge Sawyer in 1870 for that reason. I told him the party was not given to Sawyer, but Miss Lake, and that the bar were not invited, but such persons as we knew and had room to entertain were indebted to, and that there was no disposition to cut, but that circumstanced as we were, we could not invite him. He subscribed $500 to the L.R. Fund. Mitchell masterfully manipulated Deedee by accusing him of a social slight, putting Deedee on the defensive, then selflessly throwing Deedee a large check for his latest charity. In fact, Judge Deedee was right to mistrust John Hippel Mitchell, both politically and personally. In the fall of 1872, after years of trying, John Hippel Mitchell was finally appointed to the U.S. Senate by the Oregon Legislature. While John Hippel Mitchell celebrated, Judge Deedee noted dryly in his journal, attended the reception given to Mitchell at the courthouse. Crowd radiant and immense. Mitchell's reply occupied about an hour, and was very handsomely delivered, but was little else than words. As a U.S. Senator, John Hipple Mitchell held the power to propose and vote on legislation, or bring the process to a grinding halt if he chose to. He could investigate government officials and departments. As a Senator from Oregon, he was uniquely positioned to exert influence over the territory around him. Washington Territory and Alaska had no members of Congress. Instead, as the closest state to Alaska, John Hipple Mitchell's influence covered thousands of miles. In March 1873, John Hipple Mitchell was sworn into the United States Senate. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. It was a clear victory for the ring that got him there, and one of the ring's henchmen who would most benefit from this rising star was John Carr previously known as John Lyons, and before that as John Malson. But a story was about to emerge that threatened to bring it all tumbling down. The deserted wife and child of United States Senator Mitchell of Oregon is now living in interior Pennsylvania, 
that the wife supports herself and child by doing housework, etc. She was afterwards sent back by the overseers of the poor to be cared for at home, where she is now. There is now living in a hotel in Franklin, Pennsylvania, as a servant, a woman who claims to be his wife, and the fact is so well known that his friends do not deny it. The gossip has it also that Senator Mitchell is not Mitchell at all, but that his name is Hipple. He has two names, Hipple alias Mitchell, one of which was so offensive that he left it behind. And he has two wives, one of whom he left in Pennsylvania when he removed to Oregon. When he fled from Pennsylvania, he carried off with him several thousand dollars belonging to other parties, which his law partner had to make good. No one in Oregon, or probably elsewhere, knew that he was sailing under false colors until his deserted wife made the discovery and published it to the world. I should not tell you my story if I did not feel that it is but justice to my husband, who had always abused me, that I should now be able to show him that he cannot always triumph. For the sake of my children, I would say nothing, but since his story, as told by his lawyer, Colonel Thompson, is published as you tell me, I must speak. Did Colonel Thompson tell you that when John ran away, taking money that did not belong to him, he took another woman away with him? No. Well, he did. When he went away, he took with him Mary J. Blank and was advertised in the papers at the time as the elopement of Mary J. Blank and John Hipple. Well, that is God's truth, and she was the cause of the first trouble between me and John. Tell me about your life previous to marrying Mr. Hipple. Was he forced in court to marry you for leading you astray? It is true that John Hipple ruined me. I was a young girl of only 15 at the time. He was 26. He took advantage of his position and my youthful ignorance and accomplished my betrayal. Of her little daughter, Jessie, whom John Hipple took away with him at the time of his elopement, Mrs. Hipple says, She was taken away from me when a little tender thing, and I have never seen her since. I heard of her in Pittsburgh when John ran away with her, and she cried and took on for Mama. Since that time, John has taught her that her mother is dead. If the statements of his deserted wife is true, the Senate should request the Senator to return to private life. Mitchell's crimes came into sharper focus. The public learned how Mitchell abandoned his first wife for his mistress, and then how he abandoned his mistress to take a second wife in Oregon. As far as anyone in Oregon knew, John Hipple Mitchell was a smart, charming, smooth-talking, promising young lawyer. But now, newspapers accused him of bigamy, fraud, and theft. Judge Deedy was outraged. He wrote in his personal diary, Talked with Gibbs about the Hipple affair. I think he must go down. Seduction, desertion, theft clandestine change of name and absconding and bigamy are too much for a man to carry in the Senate, though he is making a desperate fight of it. At the same exact time as his reputation was torn into shreds, one of his underhanded dirty tricks to steal another estate fell apart in full public view. It's our next John Hipple Mitchell Swindle. Just like the case of Danford Balk, this was a scheme to steal a dead man's estate. When Oregon settler Finis Carruthers passed away at the age of 42, he left behind a valuable piece of Portland property with no next of kin to inherit it. By law, if no one came forward as a relative, the land would return ownership to the state. John Hipple Mitchell wasn't about to let a very valuable thing like this slip away. His ring got to work, looking for anyone who might be related to Finis Carruthers. Miraculously, the ring found his long-lost father and brought him to Portland. Under oath, the man claimed to be Finis Carruthers' father, but then his story became shakier until it was finally revealed that the man was, in fact, a vagrant named Wrestling Joe, who was coaxed into the hoax under a promise of payment. It was a brazen, bold scheme by the ring that almost worked. Judge Deedy wrote in his diary, Moore and Davidson were arrested today for subordination of perjury in putting the old man called Wrestling Joe up to swear that he was Finis Carruthers' father, when, it turns out, his name is Nixon, and he admits it. The knives were out. 
Embroiled in multiple scandals just months into his first term, John Hipple Mitchell's own friends encouraged him to resign. Instead, he fought back. In the weeks that followed, he published not so much an apology, but an explanation. This, I frankly concede, was an indiscreet, ill-advised, and injudicious act. A great blunder, a foolish mistake. I offer for it no excuse, save my inexperience in the world, and a great desire to separate myself, as far as possible, from a past that was, and is, inexpressibly painful. It was a violation of the conventionalities of life for which I would gladly atone by a life's labor. It is not, however, in contravention of any public law. <gasps> the act at once became irretrievable. I leave it to others to judge whether thus yielding to the misdirection of a perturbed mind in days of dejection and sorrow is a sin that years of honorable effort in the walks of daily life cannot atone. His reputation in tatters, the press attacked him mercilessly. On December 10, 1873, the Morning Oregonian summed up John Hipple Mitchell. Seducer, wife-beater, deserter of wife and children, embezzler of monies collected for his clients, keeper of a mistress whom he passes off in society as his wife, bigamist for over seven years, and United States Senator under a false name, is the person by whom and whose interest this appeal is taken. This man is John Hipple, alias J.H. Mitchell, Senator from Oregon. Things got worse when the U.S. Senate formally announced an investigation of the newly seated senator from Oregon. If the Senate found the charges sufficient, they had the power to expel John Hipple Mitchell and send him back to Oregon. The ring's mightiest minion clung to his seat of power as threats came from all directions. Even worse for the ring, Ben Holliday suffered a devastating setback when the financial panic of 1873 hit the markets sending fortunes tumbling. The panic exposed over-speculation in the railroad and transportation business, where Ben Holiday was heavily invested. Ben Holiday's wealth was the lifeblood of the ring, but as this vein ran dry, another one was opening up in faraway, remote Alaska. You're listening to Wrangle History Unlocked Presents Strange Customs Part 1, The Ring of Corruption. We'll be right back after this commercial message. The new Cast Yard Diggings. Henry Saunders begs to inform miners and others proceeding to the new gold diggings that he has on hand the best selection of groceries and provisions, tools, etc. for a complete outfit, which he will sell at the very lowest rates for cash. Henry Saunders, corner of Johnson and Oriental Streets. Chapter 3. Alaska. Sitting in U.S. Army headquarters in Portland, Oregon, General Jefferson C. Davis usually relied on reports to know what was going on in Alaska. In this case, he didn't need to. He could see it with his own eyes. Steamships packed with gold miners and provisions left Portland nearly every day, bound for Fort Wrangell, Alaska, where they would embark up the Stikine River to the gold fields of the Cassiar District. Jefferson C. Davis was a legend in Alaska and in the U.S. Civil War. He had the unfortunate happenstance of having the same name as Confederate President Jefferson Davis, but that wasn't the only thing that made him famous. In 1862, Midway through the Civil War, Davis shot and killed his superior officer, General William Bull Nelson, in cold blood in broad daylight. Like John Carr, Jefferson C. Davis got away with it. He was never charged and continued his service in the Army. After the war, rather than being drummed out, he was advanced to his biggest role yet, serving as the first commander of Alaska after the Treaty of Session with Russia. Few outsiders took up more than a transient residence in Alaska, a few fur traders, some miners, and a small contingent of army personnel in Sitka were vastly outnumbered by Alaska's indigenous population. Much of Alaska was a mystery, having never been seen or documented by outsiders, but everyone knew that Alaska 
was full of indigenous people. No matter where anyone went, they encountered indigenous people in Alaska. Despite the small number of settlers, the Army's first act in Alaska was to build several forts in remote locations, often next door to native villages. This arrangement proved disastrous. In 1869 alone, the U.S. military bombed two Klingit villages in conflicts that surprised and bewildered their overseers in Washington, D.C. Reports indicated that the army corrupted, debauched, and demoralized Alaska Native people through liquor. In 1870, the U.S. Army shut down all its Alaska forts, except for the post in Sitka, and General Davis was reassigned to service outside of Alaska. Three years later, General Davis was back with even more power and responsibility. As the commander of the Columbia, he oversaw Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. By 1872, the Army abandoned all its posts in Alaska, except for Sitka. Sitka was the former site of the Russian settlement, next door to the Klingit village of Shitka, Klingit for people of the outer branch. These villagers had more continuous contact with outsiders than anyone else in Alaska. Generations of continuous contact with Europeans and Americans made them familiar with many customs and habits. And that included whiskey. Invented by Scotch-Irish monks in the 1400s, whiskey was a popular liquor, known for its rich, complicated flavor that burns the tongue and brings tears to the eyes. Whiskey is a strong liquor, and its effects are almost immediate. Like other indigenous tribes of North America, the Klingit may have created alcoholic beverages using fermentation, possibly for ceremonial use, but distilled spirits were virtually unknown. The earliest Klingit European contact suggests that the Klingit wanted nothing to do with foul-tasting distilled spirits. But prolonged trade and cultural contact with outsiders changed things, to the point where Klingit people learned the science of distillation and made their own spiritist liquors. The army sought to control the liquor trade in Alaska based on powers given to it by two laws. The first was the Indian Non-Intercourse Act of 1834. The nearly 40-year-old law prohibited anyone from distributing liquor in Indian country without a permit. The second law was the recently passed Act of 1868, where Congress and the President extended the laws of the United States to Alaska. These laws made an exemption for the U.S. Army, allowing it to import liquor into Alaska for the enjoyment of officers. Critics of this era point to the inconsistency of the Army attempting to enforce prohibition while also importing liquor, which was ultimately used to debauch and demoralize indigenous people. One thing is clear, the army believed it was in control of the liquor trade. To test this theory in court, the army looked into the village of Shitka and found Faroeta Sevalov, a half Klingit, half Russian man, making and distributing whiskey. The army seized his liquor, arrested him, and bound him to Oregon for trial. In the fall of 1872, Faroeta Sevalov, nearly 2,000 miles from home, stood in front of Judge Matthew Deedy. The case became known as United States v. Sevaloff. The defense argued that the Indian Non-Intercourse Act of 1834 did not apply to Alaska because the law only defined Indian country based on 1834's borders and territories, and nothing since had been done to update that narrow local definition of Indian country. Judge Deedy shocked everyone when he agreed, Because a country is inhabited, or owned in whole or in part by Indians, it is not therefore an Indian country within the purview of the Trade and Intercourse Acts. If Alaska didn't meet the legal definition of Indian country, then the Army had no right to enforce Indian country laws in Alaska. That meant the Army could not ban the sale of liquor in Alaska. Judge Deedy knew he'd dropped a bombshell on the Army. Nobody expected the Army to lose this case. In his decision, Judge Deedy acknowledged the inevitable surprise and pointed out who needed to fix it. 
I would not be understood as stating this conclusion without doubt. On the contrary, I have reached it with hesitation, and express it subject to correction. But in this case, it is safer to err, if at all, by declining the jurisdiction than to accept it. If Congress should think it desirable that this or any other provision of the Indian Intercourse Act should be enforced in Alaska, it can so provide beyond doubt. Farouette Sevaloff was let go, a free man. Until Congress updated the Indian Non-Intercourse Act to include Alaska, there was little General Davis and the Army could do about liquor in Alaska. The Army was already fighting for control, with one hand tied behind its back. With the Sevaloff decision, it was like fighting with two hands tied behind its back. Alaska was little more than an oddity to the American government. Most had never been there, including Judge Deedy. Its purpose to the United States was ill-defined. But, around the same time as Judge Deedy issued his Sevaloff decision, news came that finally gave the public a reason to go to Alaska. Gold. In 1872, gold prospectors Henry Tiber and Angus McCullough found gold along a stream feeding into Dees Lake in Canada's Cassiar District, accessed through the Stikeen River, which emptied into U.S. waters of southeast Alaska. At the mouth of the river sat the abandoned army post of Fort Wrangell, next to the much larger and older Klingit village of Kachkanaalk. For the past several years, the army virtually ignored Fort Wrangell as it had few outside settlers, and the Klingit were perfectly capable of taking care of themselves. But the discovery of gold on the Stikine River in 1872 was the worst possible timing for the army. A gold rush would mean merchants, traders, prospectors, and speculators. The army had no one in Fort Wrangell to keep the peace, and Sitka was over 200 miles away by steamship, a long voyage through often rock-infested waters. The trip by steamship took at least a full day in the best conditions. The U.S. Army's only man in Fort Wrangell was a deputy collector of customs for the U.S. Treasury named David Flannery. He'd held the job since the Army abandoned the post in 1870. He seldom made waves, dutifully collecting the fees, taxes, and levies due to the Customs Service on goods coming into Fort Wrangell. He was no peace officer or settler of disputes. David Flannery simply made sure the government got its money. While the U.S. government was willing to let Alaska go ungoverned, it would not let it go untaxed. The Customs Service provided a vital, essential source of income for the U.S. Treasury. Until World War I, this was the primary source of income for everything the federal government did. The $7.2 million used to purchase Russia's interests in Alaska all came from the Customs Service. In the spring of 1874, the gold rush fever claimed David Flannery too. He sent word of his resignation as deputy collector aboard a steamship, where it traveled down the coast, along the Columbia River, all the way to the Customs House in Portland, Oregon. The news from Fort Wrangell meant a unique, interesting opportunity for the right man. And Senator John Hippo Mitchell knew just the wrong man for the job. John Carr, formerly John Lyons, formerly John Malson. You're listening to Wrangle History Unlocked presents Strange Customs Part 1, The Ring of Corruption. We'll be right back after this commercial message. The Cassiar Mines. The vanguard has gone. May success gild their footprints. John Boyd, grocer, wine and spirit merchant, Patrick's Corner, Johnson Street, first store above Government Street. Miners and others who may honor him with a call may depend upon getting the very best articles at lowest prices. Packages for the mines put up with care and in first-class order. Imperial weights and measures guaranteed. John Boyd's celebrated blend of Scotch whiskey is unequaled on the coast. Please note the address. Patrick's Corner, Johnson Street, first store above Government Street. Chapter 4 Opportunity Knocks Back in Portland, John Carr was up to his old tricks. He was routinely in and out of court filing bankruptcy, 
and suing or being sued over unsettled debts. He listed his occupation on the 1870 census as saloon keeping, and in 1872, he bought two horses to transport people around Portland. This was his public face, but privately, he was part of an underground criminal ring of election-stealing, influence-peddling, and arm-twisting henchmen of two powerful men, Portland's transportation tycoon Ben Holiday and his ambitious underhanded lawyer and now U.S. Senator from Oregon, John Hipple Mitchell. John Carr, along with his fellow henchmen, liked to hang around Portland's U.S. Treasury building so much that the press adopted a name for them, the Customs House Ring. From the September 19, 1873 Albany Democrat, the Republicans of Oregon will not accept this dishonor. Hereafter, there will be no question who were the enemies of the Republican Party. The Custom House Ring, organized by John H. Mitchell's skill in the use of unclear material and supported by Mr. Holliday's money till it became strong enough to seize the control of the whole party. The Ring was ruthless. One month later, the Albany Democrat republished an allegation of vote buying. He says that when he was approached by the Senator Mitchell's creature, he was told that if he would vote for Hiram Smith, he would receive $5. This is the way in which Multnomah County was carried for Hiram Smith. Let it be understood by the venal tools of Senator Mitchell that there is no shield or shelter for such miscreants behind the cloak of party. Meanwhile, we shall expect the collector of customs, whose inmost soul must shudder at the bare recital of this infamous scheme, to institute a rigid inquiry into the guilt of such of the Custom House chain gang as may be implicated in this card business. Sometimes the papers called it the Mitchell Ring because these were John Hipple Mitchell's minions carrying out his bidding. The ring's power and influence stretched so far north that the Puget Sound Dispatch called it by another name. The Alaska Ring. A number of speculators whose headquarters are in San Francisco succeeded in getting the coal fields of Alaska included within the provisions of the act. They have formed companies and dispatched agents to take possession of large tracts of the most valuable coal lands in the territory, the existence of which is only known to a few men. And now, in order to perfect their grabs, they expect Congress to pass a bill to extend the surveys over them. Commissioner Drummond has addressed a letter to Senator Mitchell in opposition to the scheme and there are rumors also of a combination to control and monopolize the resources of that territory. Alaska was a gem in Senator Mitchell's crown, a faraway land he'd never seen, but firmly within the sphere of his influence. All the threads of power to Alaska ran through Portland, from the army, the treasury, and the courts, to the steamships, outfitters, and business interests, Portland was the hub of Alaska. Word arrived in Portland's Customs House about the open position in Fort Wrangell like a prize had landed. Deputy Collector was a government job with a salary, status, and actual power. And the only qualification for the job was to know the right person. The National U.S. Customs Museum Foundation describes it like this. For almost 100 years after America's founding, Appointments and promotions within the federal government's civil service were made according to the spoils system. Civil service positions were doled out according to political loyalty and favoritism, enabling well-connected individuals to rise to positions of incredible power based on nothing more than who they knew. As perhaps the most important agency in the civil service, Appointments within the U.S. Customs Service operated on this system of favoritism for prominent families and political supporters. The spoils system allowed John Hipple Mitchell to reward one of his most loyal henchmen, a man who had proven himself up to any task, and he was a man who had experience in gold rush towns. On May 4, 1874, the Oregonian reported, John A. Carr of this city has been appointed collector of customs for Fort Wrangell, Alaska. A few days later, John Carr, previously known as John Lyons and before that as John Malson, left behind his family and boarded a steamship to Alaska. It was yet another fresh start. 
John Carr wasn't alone in hoping to strike it rich either. He was surrounded on board the ship by throngs of eager fortune seekers caught up in the Cassiar gold rush. But his path to wealth wouldn't be in the mines. He would mine the miners. As a bona fide agent of the U.S. Treasury, John Carr held the power to inspect goods, seize contraband, and collect money. As the only representative of Uncle Sam for miles around, he may have expected unchecked power and the ability to bend others to his will. And if he ran into any trouble, he always had his friends back in Portland and the Senate to help him out. This was the ring's golden opportunity. But John Carr was about to find out that Fort Wrangell had a king. Next time on Strange Customs, it's part two, Fools Rush In. A stampede on the Stikine River brings hundreds of fortune seekers to Fort Wrangell. As John Carr finds out, he's not the only one planning to make his fortune mining the miners. And the U.S. Army has enough and looks for the right moment to strike. Strange Customs is a Wrangell History Unlocked production. Learn more and read a transcript of today's episode at wranglehistoryunlocked.com slash strangecustoms. Email us at wranglepod at gmail.com. Music and sound effects by epidemicsound.com. Thanks to everyone who reviewed drafts of this episode. Alice Rooney, Peter Stanton, Bonnie Demersion, Peter Metcalf, and Vivian Faith Prescott. Tune in next week for Strange Customs Part 2, Fools Rush In. I'm your host, Ronan Rooney. Thanks for listening.